bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. I will say the Lord, He's my rock, He's my fortress, in Him will I trust. Today we honor Him and we glorify Him. We thank Him for life and sparing our life, for bringing us here together to lift up His name yes. in worship and in praise and to share His word among ourselves and to others, those that are listening, those that are hearing. We appreciate your undivided attention. We, we appreciate your support. We speak words of encouragement. We speak the truth. We're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because the power of God and the salvation to those of us that believe. So we, we stand here by His grace and by His power and by His might. So may God continue to bless you and keep you. In Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for your word. Let your word come alive in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls, in our spirit. Let everything we do and say be for your honor and your glory. These things we ask in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. We want to continue with the topic, um, your life is sitting with Christ in God. And we, and we were dealing with James 1, 2 to 4. And we said that we can get to Romans 5, 1 to 5 later, but Right now we are dealing with James 1, 2 to 4. And, and this is what it says. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Mm -hmm. Know that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have a perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let it ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach. And it will be given to him. Let me read verse 6 also. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Hallelujah. Amen. So our life is hidden with Christ and God. The doctrine of election. And last week we started, we started out on this portion, and we and we had made some statements, and we're just going to recap briefly. So when we look at James chapter one verse two, James said, "It says this: Can't we all joy when you fall into diverse temptations? Or if we want to summarize it, can't we all joy when you fall into various trials? Because we know that the the word temptation." really means trial. And we said that the Greek word for trial or for, temp for temptation, trial is perasmos, P-E-I-R-A-S-M-O-S, and it means put, putting to proof, or experimenting, putting to proof. You know, like we are put to proof. We are tried then. We are tested, Bob. So put in to proof. Like an experiment for good. An experiment of good. And Pirasmus is used of trials with a beneficial purpose. Beneficial purpose. In other words, with the effect or the end result as the objective. The end result or the benefit or the effect is for our good. Put in to good, put in to good use, put in to experience, put into development, put into perfection. That is the objective of trials. And God sent those things to bring us that place, a perfection. And then that word, perasmus, can also be used of trials and temptation that are divinely permitted or sent. It indicates trial by affliction and persecution. And then we, we can also say that God, he's the one that exposes us to various trials through all the various circumstances in our lives. He's the one that put us in, this, in these situations. And we should not look at it as a negative thing. We should not look at it as a predicament. We should not look at it as um, contrary to our, our faith. It, 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 it proves our faith. It, it, it works and it's, a, it's aligned with our faith. Mm -hmm. If your faith is not tested, if it's not put to trial and proven, then it's not genuine faith. Mm. Any genuine faith is proven and tested. Anything that is genuine must be put to test. You must try it. You must try the Spirit. And we know that the Holy Spirit is genuine. He's a person. He's real. He's the living God. But we, but we must try the Spirit that 
that ministries are operating under. Uh, like how how when we, when we receive the word of truth, we try it to see is it the word of God or not. But we see that this trials that God sent is not with the intention of leading us to sin, but to provide us with the opportunity to exercise and improve our various spiritual graces, especially patience. So the, the main factor in trial and testing is for the improvement or the testing or the trial of patience. And then patience will lead to hope. And hope because patience brings experience and experience brings hope. And we're gonna and we're gonna develop these things. We started to develop them, but we're gonna go further today. Then so we say that know that the trend of your faith or uh, the proof of your faith by persecution and affliction work with patience. See? The trying of your faith or the proving of your faith. We said we said put into proof, right? By experiment or uh, by experience. Put into trial, put into test by trials your faith. Put into the test. By persecution and affliction, it works patience. When we submit ourselves to God's will, whether in divine blessing or not, under this trial and testing, our faith will grow and our patience will grow. We must submit. See, we must willingly submit. We walk in love and obedience. Submit means to give yourself over unto. You do not rebel. You, you do not fight. You do not struggle. You do not turn aside. So that knowing at the train of your faith work with patience. Patience, as referred to in the New Testament, includes not only willing, willingly bearing affliction, and we're going to say that and we had defined what affliction is, what it entails, what it involves. And besides that, it includes pain, sorrow, losses, losses in your life, financial, economical, health, uh, uh, let's say even uh, relationships, any loss, troubles, disappointments. When we are placed are uh, exposed to these circumstances, are these things, we must bear them without resisting, as I said, because you're submitting, without resisting and without murmuring or without complaining. But we must also look at it from another perspective. You have a fixed determination to proceed through all these hindrances, all these persecu persecutions without wavering or giving up. You see, you're fixed in your mind that under no circumstances are you going to give up. You're going to press on. You're going to proceed. You're going to endure. He that endure to the end, the same will be saved. Let me repeat it again. He that endure to the end, the same will be saved. Matthew 24, 13. And we're going to deal with that a little bit later. In other words, if you want to, if you want to like rephrase it, it is to persevere. You see? Under all trials and testing, no matter how and when they are presented to us. Endurance, uh, to endure, presupposes some form of trial, testing, stress, pressure, and persecution. So when we hear the word endure or endurance, we have the idea or uh, presupposition in our minds that it involves stress. It involves trial. It involves testing, pressure, or persecution. So when we hear endure, endure what? Something. Perasmus, endure, right? Testing, trial. Endure. Endure. It presupposes that there's a, 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 a test coming. If I said to you, endure, right away, you might, you might going to go to something, what? Means that something, like, unless it's stressful, some test is coming, 
Some trial is coming. Some persecution is coming. Uh, we can also say, in other words, it's not only passive. You see, endurance is not passive. Endurance doesn't expect you to sit down and not be under any any trial or any testing or any stress. Right? It doesn't, it doesn't give that connotation or bring that connotation to your mind. But what it does, it brings a brave, active perseverance in spite of difficulties that our duty and obedience demand according to God's will. Because God's will demands active obedience. It demands doing. It demands putting yourself in unfavorable circumstances sometimes to bring about what God intends. When we preach the word of God, we, we are placing ourselves as, as out there as some of the living God, but we are going to be bomb bombarded. We are going to be criticized. We are going to be like put under duress by sin, trying to counteract what we are doing. The same nature by Satan, by people, by even sometimes your own brother and your own sister. Mm. But you have to persevere. You know, we persevere because God do what? God does what? God God preserves. See, God preserves and keeps. Because of his perseverance, we can persevere. See, he preserves us and we persevere in that action that he does. To keep us. So now let's get down a little further. We're going to progress a little further now. Because remember, we said that knowing that the train of your faith produces patience. Now we want to see now, we know that. We want to see now that other clause, but let patience have her perfect work. Let patience have her perfect work. We should allow patience to be fully exercised and tested and tried in order to reach its highest level of perfection. There's no shortcuts. There's no aborting. There's no stopping. There's no turning back. You must let the trial continue to the end. That's what I said. Let patience have her perfect work. And uh, of course, the writer is personifying. Patience as, as a person. That's right. That's it, her. Give it like a a, 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 a definition of a person is her. So let patience have her perfect work. Let it, let it achieve its goal then, its intent, its purpose. Remember, God sent trials for a specific purpose. Mm -hmm. And it will only be successful when it is carried out to the end. As I say, he that endures to the end of sin shall be saved. Amen. That, that scripture comes from that. Because Jesus was Jesus speaking in Matthew 24 about things that are going to happen in the world. Circumstances, what's going to come upon mankind, come upon people. But if you endure to the end, the sin shall be saved. When we go back to, let's go back to Matthew 11 a minute, 27. All things have been delivered to me by my father. And no one knows the son except the father. Now does anyone know the father except the son? And the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come on to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, and I'll learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So let patience have a perfect work. What do we do when we are under stress and trial? We go to Jesus. He says, Come. Come to me. And he that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. The admonition. A James is to let patience have her perfect work. So we should allow this patience to be fully exercised and tested and tried in order to reach its highest level of perfection. That's his God intent, that we be perfect. Be perfect in all and every way. Because remember, uh, Hebrews 10, 14 says that by one offering, he have perfected forever them that are being sanctified. By one offering, by offering himself, Jesus have perfected us, perfectly sanctified us forever. So we know how to let that work out. Remember, sanctification is to deal with our, our present state. Our present state of transforming us into complete holiness. The complete image of Christ. 
So God is using testing and trials. He's using blessings. He's using the spirit. He's using the word. But he's using, it, uh, he's using our personal experiences to test and to try us, to perfect us. That's the, oh, that's the end result. That's his objective. That we become perfect. And every good, and every good, uh, and every aspect of our lives lacking nothing. So now, what should be our mindset? Remember we said that we should not murmur and complain when we are put under trial and testing. So what frame of mind should we have? What should we display? Or what should we portray? First, we must have a humble mindset. Humble. Humility. A humble attitude under suffering. It's God's will. So, we said we must submit. How do you submit? By being humble. In mind, remember your mindset. And also your attitude then. You know, like when you are approached by people, you, you like respond with harsh words. Or you are like impulsive. Nah, nah, leave me alone. What's the matter with you? Leave me alone. I don't want to be bothered. Somebody might say to you, good morning. What's so good about the day? What's so good about the morning? No, no, no. We must have a pleasant, humble attitude. Let our yes be yes and our no be no. But we're doing it with humility. And whatever state I find myself, I'm content because it's God's will. I'm contented with the, the, let's say, the progression of my life. I'm contented with what is being seen or done in me. Because it's God's will. Because now you're under testing, you're under trial. So you mean you, lo you lost something important. You know, again, as I said, sometimes we, we want to pray for people and they're under trial and tested and we want to abort the trial. But let patience have her perfect course or her perfect work. Do not abort it. So when we pray for people, don't try to get them out of the situation. Get it asked that God first and foremost will give them strength. Well, it will encourage them, counsel them to endure. He that endures to the end of the sin shall be saved. Remember, God is not going to leave you there forever. He's going to bring you out. You got to let patience have a perfect work so that gold, like gold, is tested and proven by fire. Take it out too early, the work is not complete. You know, it's the worst thing you could ever do is when you're baking a cake. Is to open the oven before the the cake had risen and then from across. If you open the door too quickly, the oven take a, like reduce the heat, it's gonna collapse. Yeah. And the cake is gonna be spoiled. You gotta let it reach its peak potential. You see, how do you reach the full potential? By striving. Enduring. If you stop, you're taking a test and you start halfway the test, you're going to fail. That's right. You have 50 questions, you only answer 20. Mm -hmm. How can you expect to pass the test? You must struggle to the end. So by, we must have a humble mindset and attitude on the suffering. Second, by acknowledging it is God's will and purpose for them. Lord, it is your will. Says it's your will, let it be so, let it be done. Jesus said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. Let this cup pass on me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. You, we must acknowledge that. So somebody can tell that's not God's will. You know, that's why you have to be very careful. It is not God's will for you to be sick. It is not God's will for you to, 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 to suffer loss or to be in poverty. See, that's what they tell you. That's what they preach. And you're like, and if you're a mature Christian, you're just like started out, you're like between two opinions, you're, you're double-minded. Right. You're unstable in your ways. A double-minded person will always be unstable in their ways. Because you're between this and that, between this and between. But now, when you grow in confidence and grace, you're going to understand that it is God's will for your life. You must acknowledge it. And as I said, God is going to do what he's going to do if you acknowledge it or not. So it's better for you to just acknowledge it. And as I said, I always I always have this, this is me now, I'm speaking from my, my personal experience. I have this default position 
I, I don't understand what's going on fully. But I'm, I'm between two opinions. So I says, I, I would say to myself, or uh, to God, in my mind and my contemplation, I even sometimes I, 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 uh, I speak it loud or loud, verbally. No, that my way, but you'll be done. I said, just Lord, do, do what you have to do. In time of pain, too. In time of pain, I submit. That's the form of submission. What can I do? Because I cannot change situations. I remember before I wasn't like that. My wife would tell you, about 10 years ago or whenever it was, when I was under all kind of duress and stress, I'm, I'm like, Lord, why, why is this happening? I want, to, I want to be delivered. I want help. And I don't see no help coming. And I'm like, impatient. Wanting change. Nothing is happening. And now when you're facing things like losing your home or you don't have a job, it's a hard thing. There's no income. And you're wondering, where is God? Lord, I'm your child. I'm trying to do what is right, and I don't see, I don't see the outcome favorable to me. But bearing, enduring to the end, now I can understand. Now I understand. Now I see. Now I know. So no, nobody can turn my mind away now. See, my mind is fixed. It's settled. Because why? Patience has done something for me. I was very, I was very, I was a very impatient person. I was. To be honest, I was a very impatient person. I was impulsive. I just think something do it. But as I said, circumstances cause you to, to become patient. Because you don't have no choice in the matter. What can you do? You cannot change it yourself. You have to wait. So wait on the Lord. But now, and when, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen the, your heart. So the first thing God is going to do with you is to, is to give you peace of mind. See? The comfort. Under stress. Because you don't want to be, like, not, not only impatient, but, like, I would say, impulsive. Because what's going to happen, you only get many situations worse. Because it, it needs a calm cool, collective attitude, so you don't make rash decisions. The biggest problem is that we make rash decisions because of our, of our impatience. First Peter chapter th 3, sorry, First Peter chapter 1, from verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again to a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserve in heaven for you. That is what patience is going to lead to hope, right? That will not make us to shame. An inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserve in heaven for you. Who are kept, remember, who are kept. Uh, who are preserved mm -hmm. by the power of God through what? Through the faith, our true faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Now this is now we get into the, the nitty gritty, the, to, the, to, the, to the matter, center of the matter. In this you greatly rejoice. What do you rejoice in? Don't know. And you see, we are rejoicing in the hope of that Inheritance mm -hmm. that is incorruptible, undefiled, mm -hmm. that fades not away, that is reserved in heaven for, for us. That's what we're rejoicing in, right? Mm -hmm. That's what we're looking forward for then. Mm -hmm. That's what we're glorying in. That's what we're hoping for. That promise. Mm -hmm. And we see it. And we actually feel it in our spirit. But no. In this, you greatly rejoice, right? Mm -hmm. Don't know. No. Your experience is different. Don't know, for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold, that perishes though is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Remember we said that what? Gold is what? Tested by fire. Yes. 
But what did the, what the Peter say? Your faith is more precious than gold. Even a very gold that is tested by fire, your faith is more precious than that gold. And you, we know that, that gold is precious. It's a precious, it's a precious um, metal. It has value. But your faith is more valuable than gold then. Your faith will not perish. Your faith endures to end, but gold will pass away. Though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise your faith. See? Found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ comes, shall he find faith in the earth? Shall he find you faithful? Shall he find faith in you? If he finds faith in you, it means that you have endured to the end. It means that your faith is genuine. Because it has been tested by fire and trials. See? That's it. That, the, that the work of your faith, right, proves that it is valuable. See? Who, whom have been not seen love you? We don't see him, but he loves us. Do now. What do you see now? You don't see him now, right? No. But we see him in the spirit. But we don't see him actually by the, our eyes. But listen, we, we see him by the eyes of faith, not by eyes. But he said, do now, you do not see him. Yet, do what do you do? You believe, are believing, you rejoice. With joy, inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your soul. So what is the end result? The salvation of your soul. What are you looking for? To be saved. And you're gonna, he you said, with really what? Inexpressible is an inexpressible and full of glory. You see, we see Jesus. We now we see him by faith. Know that the testing of trial of our faith is working patience. We know the end result. You see, you know all that we, you see now, Pastor Peter, we are fully assured of the end result. That the testing of our faith will produce patience, and patience will produce experience, and the experience will produce hope. And hope will not make us ashamed. We are assured. You know, you know, we're gonna see later that the three Hebrew boys, when they were in the fire, mm -hmm. they made a statement to Nebuchadnezzar before they were into the fire. We know that God can. We know that He will. Then it, but then they said, We know that, but if He don't, we're not gonna bow. We know that He can because we know that He, he has power by His power. He can save us. Mm -hmm. We know he will by his love. But you know, you know what the, the common the common uh, testimony is? It's not, it's not, it's not like let's say uh, a spiritual thought anymore. It is what he actually did. So the testimony is not what he can do, not what he will do, but what he did. That's the testimony. What did he do? He preserved and he kept them in the fire. See? So now our experience now is what God has done for us. You know, you, you're going to say, the trial of your faith, okay, patience. I'm teaching to you now, right? I'm speaking to you a scripture. Oh, that's scriptural. It's the truth. I accept, I believe it. But you know what? You know what is going to be the evidence? When you actually have undergone that trial and that testing and you have come out of the fire like pure gold, then you're going to say, God can he will and he did. Yes. That's your testimony now. Hallelujah. See? So which is more powerful? Not the prophecy. Not what people prophesy to you. But what God has already done for you. That is a testimony. Oh, God will do this for you. Yeah, I believe it. Well, but where? When? How? But he, he did it. The woman at the well. She went and said, come see a man. That told me everything but myself. Is he not the Messiah? Is he not the Christ? What did they do? They ran and they went to Jesus upon the testimony of that woman. You know, what did they testify later? You told us, but we have heard with our own ears and we saw with our own eyes. So now we believe fully that he is the Messiah. Not by your testimony only. Not by your word only, but by actually undergoing and experiencing him for ourselves. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Yes. Blessed is a man that put their trust in him. Amen. That's the whole idea of testing the trial. So that the proving of your faith will work patience. You're going to say my faith was tested because I went there. I know what I'm talking about. Jesus knew what he was talking about because he underwent it. Remember, he had borne our grief and carried our sorrows. 
So now, going back to First Peter, verse, we were at verse 8, right? Don't know you do not see him, yet believe in you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Of this salvation, the prophets had inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the suffering of Jesus again. Without the suffering, there could be no glory. And the glory that would follow. See? The Spirit of Christ was in the prophets when they were testifying about Christ's glory. But indicating that they would be suffering before. They didn't understand what was, what was going on. They didn't understand it fully. You know something? I'm going to pause. I'm going to say this for now. You know Moses... We're going to see later, Moses was a prophet. He saw and he spoke a lot of things to Israel, especially concerning the law. The law was given by Moses, right? Mm -hmm. To Israel. You know something? But what, what, what did Paul say about the law? Uh, like let's say the Mosaic law, the Mosaic economy. It was, it was passed away, right? When Moses was was speaking to the people, he covered his face with a veil. Because when he was in God's presence, his, the Shekinah glory would reflect upon him, and his face would shine. But it would, it would, it would decay. So when Moses went upward among the people, what did he do? He covered his face. So that they won't see the, the, the parting glory. When he went in God's presence, he moved the veil. So what God is showing in that situation is that the law, the Mosaic dispensation is going to pass away, fade away, to make room for what? The gospel. That's why Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He probably got a salvation to them that believe. The law could not bring um, salvation to you. It can only warn you. It can only be strict and vindictive. So Moses was a minister of, of what? Condemnation. He, he ministered death. But we, what are we? We are ministers of life. You know that your ministry... Is more important than Moses' ministry. And I mean, and like, if you're going to look at the value. You're going to say Moses was a prophet. He was a great man. But as a minister of the gospel, you have, God has given you more influence. He has given you more a higher position. Because the law passed away. But the gospel is what? Rising. Rising. We, have, we operate under the power and the United Holy Spirit. See? So he has given us grace. That's what we're talking about here, right? The glories that would follow, they had an idea of it. They saw it, but they didn't understand. But we understand fully. So I said, it's prophetic. Prophets have been fulfilled. So we can look and say, yes, Jesus actually came. He lived. He died. He resurrected. And he ascended. We know that by historical facts and evidences, right? But also, we have a spiritual understanding by the unction of the Spirit. But now, the experience that we are undergoing, proving... That what Jesus said is true. We now learn from experience exactly what God is saying to us. In the word, in the prophecy, and by his son. Life, death, resurrection, and ascension. We now actually are going, undergoing it. So we're going to say, prophecy, I believe. I believe the word of God. Past, old, new. But now i actually seen it for myself. i seen it in my own eyes. i experienced it for myself. So your faith has grown now and become perfect. But it is more still. Remember, it, 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 it is still more. Mm -hmm. Until we become, until the day of redemption, we, we will become the perfect man. So don't expect your trial to stop. Don't expect the testing to stop. It's only going to get more difficult. It's going to get harder. I'm sad to say it, but it's not. I have to tell you the truth. Mm. Your testing and trial is going to become more hard and pronounced as you grow in grace. Because God, there's some, you know, like, Let's say there's low hanging fruit. Let's you know there's a term called low hanging fruit. That the fruit that is lowest is easy to pick, to reach. The fruit at the top of the tree is hard to reach. So, you know, low hanging fruit is low, little thing that you undergo on a, on a daily basis. But now, there's some things in you that God has to remove and He leave them for last. The difficult things. He start with the easy ones first to build your faith, to build your, build your, faith. To build your like, tolerance then. See? 
to build your comfort and your acceptance and your, and your submissiveness. But as you grow in grace, the test in each other becomes stronger. Because also to remember, you must consider the enemy, Satan, is, is angry at you. You are doing more harm to his kingdom. So his attacks against you are going to become more severe. In verse 12, it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us. See, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who preached the gospel to you by the spirit sent from heaven. You see that, Pastor? The law was given to Moses by angels. Mm -hmm. See? God committed the Mosaic law to angels to give to Moses. to Moses. By whom have he committed the gospel? The Holy Spirit. See? So who is more important? Who is higher in authority and power and grace? Than angels. So he didn't give the angels the, law. the gospel to preach. No. He gave it by the Holy Spirit to us. He didn't send the angels with, with a, a message to us to preach. The Holy Spirit. He interprets. Now he empowers us. He indwells us. He gives us the unction. He gives us the strength. He gives us the understanding. He, he now our minds have been enlightened. See? See, when Moses was preaching, when Moses was preaching the law, not only covered his face, he covered his face, he was preaching... Dark things they did not understand. A veil not only was on Moses' face, because that veil signified that the veil that was placed over Israel's eyes. They could not see the significance of the gospel, or maybe of the law. They could not see. They saw, they saw shadows and types, darkly, vaguely. But we see now the light, clear, distinct. Our minds have been flooded with light then. The glorious gospel of Jesus Christ have flooded our minds with light and we have understanding. We have a revelation. We have knowledge. We know. We have wisdom. Hallelujah. See, that's how our faith is built. Our faith is built on solid, solid things. Unshakable things. You know he said he's going to shake the heavens and the earth? He's going to shake so that the, those things that can fall will fall away. But your faith will not be shaken because it's standing on solid rock, solid ground. That's what testing is supposed to do. That your faith becomes strong, it won't be shaken. When you see things happening, you say, ah, that's whatever, man. God's will will be done. No, you're going to see that. Or that. You'll be fearful too. Moses was fearful when he saw the shaking and the thundering and the lightning on the mountain. He said, he said our very heart are shook with fear. But we don't fear. The Lord is my rock and my salvation. Who do I fear? But you know what happened? All that thundering and lightning and the Time on the mountain, the dark clouds, it did, what happened to it? It didn't pass away? Is it still there now? So what about the gospel? Is it still here? So what is more glorious? If the, God, if the law was given, let, let's say, in glory, and that which has come after is more glorious than the law, it stands forever. The gospel of God will stand forever. Jesus Christ. Either in, either in, if, even if it's not in word, but it's going to be in product of, of what it has produced. See? We, we will stand forever by grace. But it's by grace that we are saved through faith, right? Mm -hmm. And that is according to the word of God, according to the gospel. So we got to be evidences that the gospel will stand forever. So now, therefore, this is not the admonition, right? In verse 13, guard up your lions. Guard up the lions of your mind. See? Be sober. And rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. At obedient children. Not confirm yourself to family loss and ignorances, as in your ignorance. But as he who calls you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, right? If you call upon the Father, and we know that He judges accordingly to your work, He says, This is what we're supposed to do. Conduct yourself throughout the time of your stay here in fear. See? Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct 
receive by traditions from your father, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in this last time for you. He is available for us. He has been revealed in this last day for us. Who through him believe in God? We believe in God through Jesus Christ, through the gospel, right? Who, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. The trial of our faith brings our hope to God to maturity. Now, the, since you have been purified, or uh, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth, through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently and with a pure heart. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, through the word of God, which live and abide forever. See, as I said, the gospel lives and will abide forever. Because why? All flesh is as grass. Mm -hmm. And all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. Mm -hmm. The grass withers and its flowers falls away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. That the word of God will stand forever. Everything will pass away. But the trial of our faith produces patience. We have an inheritance. Undefiled. Reserved in heaven for us. See? Hallelujah. Thirdly. Remember that was second. Thirdly. How do we act and when we behave when we are under trial and testing? We should resist the urge to become impatient. As I said, I was a very impatient person early in my life. And thank God today I have passed from that state. I know there are going to be circumstances that are going to be difficult to bear, but by His grace, I can. Oh, we can do that next week. When Paul made a statement about by His, you know, His grace is sufficient. We, we always say that. And then we don't understand it fully, but we can deal with it. We're going to see. We're going to see. So now, totally by resisting the earth to be impatient, to murmur, to complain, and to be fretful. But instead, display an attitude of love, peace, and prayerfulness. See? Prayerfulness. That's our attitude. You're supposed to be prayerful. Even, you know, the, you, you know, the, the attitude of prayerfulness is like, Lord, let your will be done. That's a prayer, right? Lord, I'm under stress and duress. Let your will be done. Lord, give me strength. Give me, give me, give me peace. Give me joy. Lord, let, let this hope in me come alive or reach its potential. Yeah, you're prayerful. You see, so now, but you see, remember, as we said, it is not like passive. See? Endurance is not passive. You're active. You're still engaged in your daily activities, but with a, a humble mindset. A prayerful mindset. You're not murmuring, you're not complaining. You're giving God thanks. You come to church, you praise God the same way. See? You give what you can the same way. Nothing changes outwardly. But inwardly, a peaceable fruit of righteousness is, is, is in, in progress. This is the inward work we're talking about. Because the trend of your faith is patience. So when we, when we consider now the outward stress that you're undergoing in your body, the loss, the pain, the suffering, you cannot see the end result. You cannot see any changes. Because you're under pain. But where's the change taking place? In the inner man. In your faith. In your hope. See? In your spirit. In your soul. In your, in your confidence. In your joy. In your peace. In your contemplations. See? In your decision-making processes. In the will. See, God is working on the will. So you, but you don't see that. You know, that's, that scripture that we can use, this scripture that the things that are not seen are eternal, but the things that can be seen, they are just temporal, right? That you, you can apply that scripture to that situation because outwardly, you might be sick in the body, mm -hmm. but it's not forever. You can see that. But you, you're not seeing what's happening to the spirit. It's internal. 
And that is in, that's eternal. That is what is going to last forever. The change that that trial is bringing about in you will last forever. But the testing and the trial in the body will fade away. The body is going to die. But the result of undergoing this stress, now with a prayerful, peaceful, joyful, loving attitude, without murmuring and complaining. Oh, you know, the truth of Israel murmuring and complaining. And God was angry at them. What did they, what did they, what did they achieve by them murmuring? God, God scattered their carcasses in the wilderness. But remember, the trial of your favorite work of patience. Now you are a child of God. He will not cast you aside. See, he's not going to bring you to the point that you're going to give up. And that's a blessing in itself. You know what he does? We're going to see, we're going to see later again. Because we're not going to get to that today. I know we're not going to get to that today. That the reason why God chastises us because he loves us. He treat, he's, he's treating us as sons. He considers us as sons because we are sons. He chastises us. He said, what father that loves his son will not chastise him to correct him? To lead him to correction. And if he doesn't chastise him, that means he's a bastard. He's not a son. So for the, for the fact of the matter, you're undergoing these things. Uh, but they're sent by God, are allowed by God to, to uh, invade your life. It means that He's treating you as a son for your good. So that's why you that's why you know, you must know that and submit. You know, when your father beat you, you can't fight back. He's correcting you with a rod and you punch him in the head. What's that gonna solve? Are you cursing? Are you, you know, you, you know, you are very, are you destructive? You know, you kick the, the, the dog. You know, there's a, there's a saying that the boss yells at the secretary. The secretary cannot yell at the boss. She goes home and yells at the husband. The husband yells at the kid. The kid has no child. He go kick the dog. <laughs> See? So now that's the supposed that not supposed to be our attitude. We're supposed to submit, and, and however God deals with us as sons, accept it, because we know it's going to work towards our good. It's going to be done towards our good. But we don't want to hear these things. No, no, we want God to bless us. We want to see. We want the nice, sweet things from God, but we don't want to receive chastisement from His hands. Hallelujah. You can't have it. You can't have it. You must have both. Hallelujah. We're going to see. Listen. We have this, this teaching that people are going to say, God doesn't send this, God doesn't do that to you. That you're going to be blessed all your life. No. No. no curse shall come upon you. No, it's not a curse. Listen. All good things come from above, from the Father of lights. All good things. Yeah. Everything that God that sent to his son, allow his son to experience is good. It's not even, it's not wrong, it's not bad. In fact, again, God can do with us what if he wills. We're his. Can I not do with, with you what I will? Yeah, with my money. You know, I can do what I will with you. You're mine. Mm. And he will do it anyway. You know, but, but remember something. You can either let God do, die, do what is necessary to transform you into his image that you become holy like him. Or you, you can let him do with you, what justice demands? You, what, which one do you want? God's mercy or his justice? Hmm. You want God's grace in your life or you want his, 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 his um, severe severity experience? Which one do you want to experience? Because if we know that his justice is going to demand your death and cast a cast separation in hell. Hmm. But his love and his mercy is going to transform you into his image, the image of his son, so you can live away with him. You got to be changed. Oh, we want to be raptured. We want to be changed. We want to be glorified instantaneously without undergoing stresses and trials and pressure. Not going to happen, brother. Not going to happen. That's not a normal thing. If it happened to one or two individuals in the Bible, well, so be it. What, what am I saying? Endure to the end. The sin will be saved. So now we must not murmur and we must not complain. What does 1 Peter 4 say? 1 Peter 4, verse 12 to 19. Beloved, and this is Peter, he always like to write like this. Do not think it strange 
concerning the fiery trials, which is to try you. See? Mm -hmm. As though some strange thing happened to you. Mm -hmm. Again, the attitude supposed to be rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed again, it is to be when Christ's glory is revealed. When we are to be glorified. See? That is what that's what is leading towers. That is that is leading that that's what hope is pointing towers. When his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding exceeding joy. Why are you going to be glad? Because you're going to be glorified too. See? Your hope is going to be fulfilled then. It is going to be the end of your journey. You're not going to, you're not going to reap the benefits of your trial and testing. Now you have accepted it. Right? You have proven it. Your favor has been proven. But now you're going to actually be re receive the reward for undergoing all these things. So your joy now is going to be complete then. It's going to be fulfilled. Your hope is going to transition into joy. Because when that which is present is present, you don't hope anymore. See? You hope for something with a, uh, with a, a mindset of looking forward for. But when that thing is has come, you don't need any more hope. You have it. So you have to say, your joy, you will be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. How happy are you then? See? It's a blessing then. For the spirit of glory of God and of God rests upon you. The spirit of Christ then. The spirit of glorification. The spirit of that will transform you into Christ's image. Is resting upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed. The Jews, the enemies of Christ, right? But on your part, he is glorified. So you know when people in the world are being tested, they try to blaspheme God. Why did it is a God? Why is this happening to me? You know, if God is so loving, why did my son die? You know, you hear these things. Yeah. Well, if, 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 if there's a God, if God love is so loving, why am I suffering? He's being blasphemed. He, you know what you're doing? You're speaking against the word of God then. You're not only speaking against the word of God, you're speaking against the Holy Spirit, really. Under the testimony of one or two witnesses, the person that validated the law was put to death. How much greater punishment do you think you're going to deserve when you reject the gospel? When you trample underfoot the blood of the covenant, right? When you reject the quickening, graceful power of the Holy Spirit. See, the law, you was put to death and you will have one or two witnesses. But how much greater punishment you think you're going to deserve when you trample underfoot the only means of salvation that God has offered to you? How much greater punishment you think you're going to deserve when you ridicule and blaspheme the Holy Spirit? See? It's going to be a greater punishment. So now, you know, like the law was tricking severe. So, you know, so whoa, we have, we, we, we under grace now. So, you know, the God is the great, God is loving, he's kind, he's generous and loving and merciful. So people don't even want to respect the gospel anymore. And some people preach the gospel and they do anything, with anything, uh, 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 like let's say do whatever they want. Brother, the gospel is more strict than the law. For that same reason I just spoke about. We don't consider it from that perspective, but it is. The law was glorious, but the gospel is more glorious. The penalties of rejecting the gospel is greater. Because that is the only means of salvation. If you tread on the foot the blood of the covenant, you don't respect Jesus' blood, how can you be saved? If you reject the Holy Spirit's striving and, and convincing power, how are you going to be saved? And God is, you know, in the, then it ended, you know that, that same thing ended with? God is a consuming fire. We're going to see next week when they read the scriptures. I just, I just, I just paraphrased them, but I have it here. I'm just, you know, sometimes we, the, the Holy Spirit let you see things or the place for whoever is going to hear. Let have, whoever has ears to hear will hear. But that just came to my mind because we are reading it right here. You see, if you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Say, on their part, he is blasphemed. 
but on your part he's glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, an evildoer, uh, as a busybody in other people's matter. Listen to me. If we suffer as a Christian doing the things of God, it is right and it's correct. Because God is allowing us to be tried and tested in those things that will bring about transformation of our lives. But look, he said, don't let you suffer for a murderer. If you, if you, if you, suffer, if you kill somebody and you are put to death or you are tortured or you are beaten, brother, that's not from God. See? You are suffering because you, you deserve it. As a murderer, don't let none suffer because you are a thief. An evildoer, a busybody in other people's matter. You like to gossip. You like to, you're a gypsy, as, as we would say in Barbados, you're a gypsy person. You like to get into every, every person's business and then go and speak about it openly. Now he says, yet, if anyone suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. You're going to rejoice. Remember, glorify. Glorify, glorify him is signified by rejoicing, by praising, by thanking God, right? By expressing gratitude to God. See? So you're going to glorify God in any matter because you're suffering as a Christian in the things of God and you're not going to be ashamed. But if you are a murderer, a thief, a busybody, a liar, you're going to be ashamed if you suffer for that. It's going to bring shame to you. For, no, 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 important, important, important. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? God is going to use chastisement and correction to us, his children first. So that we can be transformed, that we will stop doing these things and do the right thing. See? So judgment must begin with us first. He's going to judge the world in righteousness. But he judged his own first. He judges us first. So that we will not be what? Consumed with the, with the, with the others, the ungodly then. Because when, what, what God is judging us, are do, to, his judgment is to do what? To transform us. To, to correct us then. To tell us you are wrong. Change. But that judgment for the ungodly is for their doom and their punishment. So that's what he says. And if it begins with, with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? What is going to be their end? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, oh my goodness. Pastor Peter, we are scarcely saved. If the righteous one, if we, the elect, the chosen, the believer, the beloved of God is scarcely saved, Barely saved, right? What is going to be the result or the end of the ungodly? Where will the ungodly and sinner appear? He will not appear in the congregation of the righteous. See, he has no hope then. There's no hope of deliverance. Why? He remember he trampled on the foot, the blood of the covenant. He rejected the spirit of grace that was presented to him. So where will he appear? He will appear in the judgment before the seat of Christ to be te tested and tried and cast into hell. Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as a faithful creator. So we are not going to be, we are not going to be liars, murderers, fornicators, adulterers, thieves. thieves, gossipers. We're not going to be unbelieving. We're not going to doubt. But we're going to do what is right. So that we can now appear before God and, our, and we will not be ashamed. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? Mm -hmm. But we are not going to be ashamed if, we, if faith, proven, genuine faith is found in us. Faith that has been tried. Faith that has been obedient. Faith that has produced love and compassion. 
that have produced worship, that have produced joy, that have produced peace, that have produced long sufferingness and gentleness, that have given an attitude of, of loving kindness, that have given an attitude of praise and worship and thanksgiving to God. It, when that faith is, 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 is found to be there, it's genuine. And we will not suffer as the ungodly. So may God bless and keep you. We're going to stop here today because there's more, but we can't go any further. I think I, I have said enough. Sure. And, uh, and, and I hope these words will be encouragement to you. I do not know what you're undergoing at this moment. What trial, what pain, what test that God has allowed to pass your way. But be sure that God is with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. This you know that the train of your faith will produce patience. And patience will produce experience. And experience will produce hope. A hope that will not make a shame. And do not try to abort this test in the train. Let it produce its perfect work. Let patience have her perfect work, or her perfect course. May God bless and keep you. In Jesus' name, amen.